Welcome back to Fishing Tutorials. In this video, we're gonna be looking at how to catch more carp from big waters. Specifically, we are making this video because we recently uploaded Reservoir Diaries Season 3, a film about Alex and I's campaign to try and catch a big mirror in a, uh, a large reservoir. That video mostly focused on the story of the fishing and stuff like that. So in this video specifically, we wanted to address some of the questions that might come up from it surrounding the approach, the tactics, the sort of mindset behind fishing large waters. So that is what we're gonna run through in this video today. As you will have heard many, many times before, the most important aspect of fishing, whether you're fishing somewhere big or small, is location. You have to be fishing the area of the lake where the fish are. When it's a very large water, it gets quite difficult sometimes to locate those fish, especially if it's relatively low stock, like the place that we were fishing in Reservoir Diaries Season 3. Our advice to you guys, the viewers, would definitely be, if you're a little bit lost and a bit stumped as to where to start on a big water, mostly focus on the depth of the water that you're, that you're fishing in. A lot of the time, uh, large waters will have uh, a certain area which is deeper and a certain area which is shallower, uh, on the reservoir that we were fishing, it started off deep near the large dam and then shallowed up towards uh, the inlet where the water flows in. Our advice would definitely be if the water's relatively warm, especially if it's getting warmer, take a look in those shallower areas because the fish will often move into shallower water because that water warms up the quickest. When the sun hits that water, it doesn't take very long to make a couple of foot or three or four foot of water warm up quite fast but it takes a long long time for 20 foot of water to get warm so if it's springtime the sun's out I definitely focus my attention on areas of the lake that are relatively shallow that said if it's more like autumn time or you're heading into winter let's say and the water is getting colder that shallow water gets cold faster too so it's often worth looking for an area of the lake which has got a bit more depth maybe 10 foot 15 foot or so or even a little bit more if the temperature is dropping and getting colder in the case of our campaign we found in a previous spring some fish in very shallow water by the inlet however when it came to us actually fishing the lake a few years later it was autumn time and we found the carp in around 10 to 15 foot of water a little bit further down the lake into slightly deeper deeper areas the other thing that is really important to look for when you're fishing large waters is the habitat that the carp would like to live in. So on some large waters there's uh, particularly weedy areas, other areas that are very snaggy, and other areas which seem to be sort of just muddy and silty and there's not really much going on and not much uh, reason for the carp to be there. The reason why weedy areas are often so prolific for carp fishing is because the weed holds food for the carp, like snails and bugs and those sorts of things. So it's definitely worth looking uh, carefully at weedy areas, particularly if it's newly growing weed or if it's near the end of the season, if that weed's sort of just beginning to die off, it's also worth checking out those areas too as the food becomes exposed for the carp. Another bit of advice when it comes to location is definitely consider actually looking for bream and other small species of fish. I know you probably won't be wanting to catch the bream if you're carp fishing on a big lake, but the shoals of bream often uh, can really give away where the carp are likely to be too, especially in springtime. We have often found shoals of bream gathering up to spawn, and when, they, when it comes to that sort of time, the, the bream are gonna be releasing their eggs pretty soon. The carp are always close by, as the carp know they can you know, eat, eat up the eggs coming from the bream spawning. The other thing to remember is that if there are large shoals of roach and perch in a certain area of the lake, it probably is because there's lots of food or the water's a little bit warmer. So although you might not be fishing for those smaller species, definitely consider fishing the areas where you see them because it's likely there might be carp nearby. One tool that we've used to great effect is actually Google Maps, particularly on very large waters where you really don't know where to start. Google Maps can give you a, a good idea of where access points are to the water and sometimes if the water's quite clear, those aerial maps can actually show you areas of the lake that have got weed growth or are a little bit shallower, for example. On waters with murky uh, coloured up water, it's not so helpful because you can't really see through in the satellite imagery, but some places you can actually get a really good idea of the water from those aerial photos on Google Maps. The last thing I'll say about location is it can be a little bit daunting and indeed quite overwhelming when you turn up to a large body of water and decide that you're going to fish it because you can often just not know where to start. 
We've certainly felt that way in the past. And what we tend to do is begin to break the large body of water up into smaller parts. So for example, on the reservoir that we fished recently, we decided to write off one arm because we hadn't seen any fish in it. And that particular arm of the reservoir seemed quite deep. Um, there wasn't a lot of weed growth in it. So we just went, right, ignore that one and broke the reservoir up into the longer, thinner arm. Once we'd decided that that was an area we liked, we could then sort of focus our attention all on that rather than getting overwhelmed and confused about the massive expanse of water outside of that arm. We just focused on a little bit of it and approached it like you would a lake of its own. Next up on my list of topics that I'd like to talk to you guys about is rigs. Rigs are obviously a very important aspect of carp fishing and a lot of people spend a lot of time perfecting their rigs just to make them uh, exactly right and gaining confidence in a certain setup or whatever. What I'd say is that you shouldn't really vary your rigs that much depending on whether you're fishing a large or a small water. If it works on a small water, it's probably gonna work on a large one too. The things I would definitely consider though are are the carp much bigger than what you fished for in the past? If so, consider a larger hook or a slightly longer hook link, for example. And the other thing is make sure it's strong enough. Sometimes you'll actually need stronger tackle for fishing small waters because you're more likely to be in proximity of weed or snags. But if your large water that you're uh, intending to fish has got a lot of snags in the water, tree stumps, fallen trees, the lot, uh, definitely tackle up strong and make sure that your hooks are capable of dealing with large fish and snaggy conditions. But I wouldn't say you should really change your rigs just because you're fishing a bigger water. There's no real need to do that. The other thing that you'll probably think about whilst tying up your rigs and preparing your kit is what sort of hook bait you want to use. I wouldn't say a different hook bait should really be required for fishing a larger water, but it's definitely worth considering using a larger bait if there are large shoals of bream around. Waking up five or 10 times throughout the night to reel in bream is definitely not my idea of fun unless I'm targeting them specifically. So I'd say if you're trying to single out carp and you're on a big water with large bream shoals, consider using snowman hook baits with 15 millimeter pop-ups and 20 millimeter bottom baits. That's certainly something that has helped us avoid bream in the past, especially when it's combined with quite a large hook like a size four. When fishing the deep reservoir in our recent video, we found it was quite snaggy, so it became apparent to us that we needed to avoid cutoffs, uh, which are inevitable if you're fishing somewhere that's very snaggy or it's got uh, mussel shells or you know harsh gravel or rocks and stuff on the bottom. To avoid those cutoffs, I'd use something like the Armour Cord uh, Snag Leader. You can use you know a couple of rod lengths of that behind your lead, just to minimise the risk of your line getting broken on those snags and stuff. The armor cord is pretty abrasion resistant and that, that should pull through almost anything. The third topic and a very important one when fishing large waters is bait. On these large lakes, it can be very helpful to use bait to try and stop the fish and hold them in an area to maximize the chances of you catching a few. You can often find fish on big lakes quite nomadic. They won't spend a lot of time in any one area. They'll be on the move all the time on the, on the persistent um, search for food. So if you find some fish and get something going and you're catching a few, it can dry up quite quickly if you don't introduce some bait to try and hold those fish in a certain area. When we first start on a, on a water, we do often go in with single hook baits and we will move swims regularly, just trying to find and locate where the carp are. We'll just chuck a hook bait out, maybe a few scatterings of bait around it. But to be honest, the point at which we find fish, you know, we see a few fish crash or we catch a couple, that's when we begin to introduce bait. So what bait do we use when we're fishing on large waters? Now, of course, we'll introduce boilies because they are a bait which avoids the attentions of, of bream and roach and stuff like that. But we will also mix in tiger nuts, maize, uh, hemp, that sort of thing, just to bulk out the mix and enable us to put in more bait for the cost. Boilies can get expensive and although they are a brilliant carp catching bait, if you want to put in enough of it, it can, you know, the price can start to add up. So what we'll often do is we'll take a kilo or two of boilies, as well as a load of maize and tiger nuts. We'll buy the particles dry, prepare them ourselves and introduce them uh, to bulk out the boilies. Whatever type of bait you decide to use on your water, the important part of that baiting process is that you try and keep it quite consistent. If you want to get fish feeding in a certain area, then you really want to be trying to introduce at least a bit of bait into that spot a couple of times a week minimum, really. 
when we've had real good hits on, on, on large waters and caught quite a lot of fish, it's tended to be because we've baited up regularly throughout like a week or two leading up to our session. I'm not saying you have to be there every single day, but definitely try and keep a little bit of bait trickling into the swim to maximize your chances of fish being there waiting for you when it comes to your session. Now let's take a look at the tackle that we use for approaching large waters. Now if you've watched our videos quite a lot, you're probably quite aware that we like to use short rods, like 10 footers, for most of our carp fishing. The accuracy that you can get on an underarm cast with a 10 footer is unbeatable. And also when you're trying to flick rods underneath, you know, um, uh, overhanging branches on an island or something, a 10 foot rod is really, really nice. It's also great for stalking because you can hold it in your hand and it's not too heavy. However, when it comes to somewhere that is, you know, 50 acres, 60 acres, 100, 200 acres, you're gonna feel pretty outgunned with a short rod. So what we like to use is a three pound test curve, 12 foot uh, rod on a, on a large place. Because you need, you need that extra length for a big cast. We would definitely advise a three pound test curve or heavier, like a 3.5 or even a 3.75, simply because you'll often find fish at long range and it's no fun if you're whacking the rod out as hard as you can and you can't reach those fish. So with a 3.5 pound test curve, 12 foot rod, like the ones I've got here, combined with a big pit reel, you're able to put a four ounce lead on and absolutely sling it to the horizon to try and reach where those carp are feeding. On the reels, we will mostly prefer to use monofilament line. We find mono quite nice to fish with. It doesn't get so many tangles as braid. It's very forgiving, so when you're playing a fish and it's fighting hard, you get less hook pulls because there's a bit of stretch in the monofilament. However, there's one time where we will switch over to using braid on the reels, and that is if we're fishing towards snags or we're fishing in an area where we need that bite to be registered on the alarm immediately. Basically, if a fish picks up the bait and starts swimming off with it, and you've got mono on the reels and you're fishing a long way out, that fish can pull quite a long way before the stretch is taken out the line, and then you get a bite. So. When we're fishing with mono, it's possible that you can end up getting snagged up more often if you're fishing towards like fallen branches or underwater obstructions. So if it's snaggy, definitely get on the braid so that you can get the bite immediately, no stretch, and really start pulling the fish out of those snags. A couple of other items of kit which are not essential but very, very beneficial are if you are able to use a boat, that's obviously going to be a massive edge. On the place that we fished recently, we weren't actually allowed to use boats, it wasn't really within the rules, so that meant we had to fish from the shore and always be casting. If you are able to use a boat though, it can really help with your baiting up accurately, it can also help with searching out new areas of the lake and bringing your kit to the swim depending on where you can park and stuff like that. The other thing is from a boat, you can often uh, use an echo sounder or lead around off the edge of the boat to really um, suss out what the lake bed is like. And that's far more easy and you can get a better picture of what the bottom looks like doing that than just casting from the shore. So a boat is obviously a benefit, but if you can't use them, it's no, no big deal really. You're just gonna have to work out areas that you can fish from the shore. I mentioned echo sounders and you can get those types that go on your boat and professional ones, or you can grab a castable sonar device like a deeper fish finder. And we've used those when we just wanna turn up at a spot and instantly know how deep is it out here? Is it worth fishing? Is there much weed growth around? And we can chuck it out and find out very quickly. However, of course, any advances in technology like bait boats, boats or echo sounders, the lot, some people won't want to use that sort of thing and other people will. So that's just a matter of personal preference. If it's your thing and you like the technology and you want to give yourself every edge that you can, crack on. If you'd rather just go down the, the route of, you know, fishing it properly, old school or whatever, then that's also cool. Whatever works for you. Nothing though is a replacement for good old watercraft and keeping your eyes on the water, especially around the times of dawn and dusk, will catch you more carp than any technology will. So hopefully that's answered a few questions that you might have had about how to catch more carp from large waters. If you've got any more questions or I haven't really explained anything specifically, then definitely stick a comment down below and I'll be really happy to try and help you out. Anyway, good luck with your carp fishing this year and in the meantime, definitely check out these couple of videos to learn a little bit more about carp fishing. We'll see you guys soon.